Do you take any responsibility at all for the amount of money you've made people spend on watches over the last couple of years? I mean, you've ruined credit scores. You probably ruined relationships. You just keep making everything look cool you, with your little coffee and watch shots. I know, I know the tricks. So Ronnie, you're an internationally renowned comedian. You're a senior correspondent on The Daily Show. You have a Marvel movie coming out and you had a hit Netflix special. Every night in America is like a competition to see how many screens we can get between our face and the wall. Right? <laughs> it's like iPhone, iPad, laptop, TV, and then Apple Watch. Okay? Thank you so much for joining us for Talking Watches. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Talking Watches got me through the pandemic. I don't know about anyone else watching out there, but when I was in the middle of the pandemic, I was watching a lot of the Talking Watches episode just to, I don't know, feel a sense of normalcy, or as my wife would call it, a midlife crisis. <laughs> um, and it also got me more interested into watches, so. Well, it's very kind of you to say, um, and I'd really love to take a look at your collection today. That's what we're here to do. Yeah. So how did you get into watch collecting? Or is that something that came later? So what happened was when I moved to America, I thought I should get myself an adult watch. So uh, this is kind of what, this is kind of what started me into watch collecting. Because if you know the Speedmaster, Omega Speedmaster, mm -hmm. as you, I'm sure you do know, this guy's like, what am I talking about? This, <laughs> this dude's like the Michael Jordan of watches over here. Like, do you know, Too do common. you know a Speedmaster? Um, <laughs> if you, if you do any amount of research into a Speedmaster, you very quickly go down a hole. Yes. Because it there's is. There's so many of them. There's so many. So I think this is kind of what got me into the idea of collecting watches and the variants and the little things that make a watch different and special. Mm -hmm. And I was just looking for something that was a bit more adult appropriate as a timepiece, yeah. but also didn't break the bank. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I ended up settling on Speedmaster because I just thought it was cool that he went to space. Mm -hmm. Everyone's like attracted to the space story. You know, yeah. you're never going to go to space. <laughs> No one's going to go. To, yeah. yeah, you're never going to go to space. <laughs> but the fact that these were the watches that they used to get to the moon. Yeah, it's like if they went to the moon with this, you can you can do five minutes of comedy. And part of my philosophy in life, and which carried over into collecting, was I'm always looking for that little bit of difference, right? Mm -hmm. And this was kind of different to the moon watch. Because it had leather straps, it kind of looked a little different. And so, so a little bit smaller too. A little bit smaller. The alpha hands. Yeah. yeah. It's a special watch. Yeah. And, and so that's what kind of attracted me because it, it's a little different to the norm, you know, mm -hmm. which kind of really matches how I go about how I do things and also how I collect things. But then the, the first watch that you got is this Seiko 5 here. And this was a watch that you said you wore a lot in college. Yeah. So I was in college with no money and then... The idea of an automatic watch was really cool at the time, you know, like the idea that, oh man, this thing's, it, you just wear it and it winds. What was that? That's magic. And yeah. you don't have to charge it. Like yeah. what, you know, and we're so used to quartz. And so I think I got this on the internet back in the early days of internet shopping. Sure. And I was looking for something with clear numbers that was self winding and had the date and the day of the week, you know, all the information you need mm -hmm. from a very practical level. And this came up and it was so affordable right. and I got it and it's lasted forever. You know, it's lasted since college and it still goes and it still runs. Called the Seiko 5. Yeah. Tried to find out what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Hodinki <laughs> doesn't even know what it means. The, the urban myth is that the 5 refers to 5 features. Yeah, 5, yeah, five like design features. Yeah, you say that, but you don't even know if that's what, you don't even know <laughs> that's, if that's what it is. I, I believe that's what, I believe that's yeah, the case. It's yeah. a, no one knows, nobody <laughs> knows. We're in Hodinky, this is the MBA of watches, <laughs> and we don't know what the 5 stands for. And even if the 5 stands for the 5 features, no one can agree on what the 5 features actually are, <laughs> right? It's day, date, automatic winding, waterproof, and then looking good. Looking good, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe the, the fifth feature is the see-through back case. Maybe I just solved the mystery there. Nobody knows. But let the mystery survive. Let some things be mysteries, okay? We don't need to Google everything. But great watch. Again, look, it's, I've had this since college, and I've never had to service it, and it looks like brand new. It's, it's unbelievable. It looks great. I would have thought that it was a newer watch, to yeah. be honest. Yeah. This is not all you have for Seiko, though. You actually have two virtually identical watches 
both with uh, a connection to uh, the actor Bruce Lee. Can you tell us a little bit about these two automatic chronographs, reference 6139, the Bruce Lee variant? Yeah, I mean, I feel like you want to talk about it more than me. So I guess thanks for, <laughs> thanks for the setup. So I was in the pandemic, consuming a lot of content as we all were. And I watched Bao Nguyen's documentary, Be Water, mm -hmm. on Bruce Lee. And it really kind of resonated with me, not just because he's Asian, but because he was an Asian person in show business, mm -hmm. in American show business, trying yeah. to tell an authentic story. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing really got me hyped up again on Bruce Lee. And just by coincidence, Talking Watch alumni down there came and I happened to talk about uh, the Bruce Lee documentary. And then he goes and mentions the Bruce Lee watch. And then as soon as he mentions the Bruce Lee watch, it's like, well, what are we doing? You're off to the races, right? Yeah, we got to go find this watch yeah. now. And so he put me in touch with his Bruce Lee watch guy, which I can't believe is a job. Shout out Nick Farrell. <laughs> and so he finds me this 6130 variant. I believe the Bruce Lee is the 6139-6010. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. I'm wearing this summer in New York City, pandemic summer. I was wearing this all over New York City, go jumping on stage. We were doing stand-up shows in the park mm -hmm. and the whole time I'm powered by this Bruce Lee watch. Part of the mythology of the Bruce Lee watch is that the only information we have about Bruce Lee having a watch comes from Bruce Lee's Instagram account. So literally, whenever they post a photo that happens to have Bruce Lee showing off his watch, the whole internet starts to jump on that. Well, not the whole internet, but the Bruce Lee watch the internet. The very small <laughs> corner of the internet. The small corner <laughs> that jumps on that and they start going like, what watch was it? And so every time a, a, a photo comes out, they get a little bit more information about it. Yeah. So they started with this. This was like the Bruce Lee watch. And then another photo came out and another photo came out. And then Nick did some research on it and he concluded in his very academic paper that he wrote on the internet that this was actually the true Bruce Lee watch. And I know there's a, there's a photo that's going to come out next week where it's going to be, this wasn't actually the one, there's going to be another one. And I'm going to keep going down this Bruce Lee variant whole until it turns out he wore an Omega. But as of this moment, this is the true Bruce Lee watch. And you know what? I, I like it anyway. And again, it's, it's kind of like a testament to the stories that these watches are about, right? Like yeah. it, honestly, it doesn't even matter. Did he wear it? Did he not wear it? You know, the fact that it's associated with him, yeah. I think it's associated with him. It, it, it's enough for me to feel empowered by yeah. wearing it. And then I'd love to talk about a couple of watches here that came to you from your father. A beautiful two-tone Datejust, and then we have uh, an Omega Seamaster. Yeah. yeah. I don't even know if I can talk about this without crying, but like, um, so this was the only watch he had. So growing up, this is the watch that would be everywhere in the house, right? Mm -hmm. You just go see it. I remember it was so much bigger in my hands when I first mm -hmm. held it. It was like, it, would, it was a huge in, in your hands, you're like, who could ever wear this? It's yeah. so big and heavy. And now it just, it feels, it feels kind of small in comparison to everything else. And then one day I, I came back to Singapore where he lived and I asked him like, hey, what happened to that Rolex they had? And he's like, oh yeah, it's in the back. And I said like, I'm not trying to get stuff from you, but if you're not wearing it, I'd love to be able to wear it. And yeah. he's like, oh yeah, yeah, just take it. So he just gave it to me. This two-tone thing is very, old Chinese person, like I wouldn't pick this in the shop, but the fact that he gave it to me and I started wearing it and you know what, it works. Yeah. It works with a white t-shirt, it works with a suit, you know, it works if you're dressed down and it, it is, it's kind of like that accent piece. 36 millimeter Datejust, uh, two-tone, yours looks like, I think yours is like from the, probably the mid-80s. Don't mid ruin this for me, do not ruin this no, for no, me. No, no, it's great, I think it's from the mid-80s. Every time you talk about watch, I get scared <laughs> that something, uh, something I believe about this is false. It looks great. Like I said, I wouldn't pick this out in a shop because me and my dad have very different tastes. But right. the fact that he gave it to me, I love it. I could lose everything here, but uh, this is probably the only one that kind of is pretty special to me. Yeah, he, he, he kind of, he passed away very unexpectedly two years ago. So it's interesting that he gave, he, uh, you know, he gave this to me just before he, yeah. he uh, left, yeah. Well, it looks great. And it's, you know, it's an, an enduring memory of your dad. You have yeah, it yeah. with you whenever you want to wear it. Yeah, yeah. And I'll sell it to the highest bidder <laughs> if anybody out there in the comments wants to. 
And you have this other watch from your dad, this uh, Seamaster. And there's a little bit of a story behind this too, where I guess you had just a bunch of broken watches. He went to China to work in the 90s. Mm. And when he was there, he bought a bag of like garbage Omegas. Just everything in it was broken Omegas. In his head, he's always like, I'm going to repair these, I'm going to repair it. But he never got around to doing it. Mm -hmm. So me in Malaysia, I was like, I'm going to go do this now. So I, I, I found a watch guy in Malaysia mm -hmm. and low stakes, right? Because who yeah. knows? It's like a literally a, a lucky draw bag of whatever you get from this bag of Omegas. And this was the only one that came out. And I look at it and I'm like, oh my God, this watch is beautiful. Like the Art Deco, the fact that it's Omega gives yeah. it some brand credibility. Beautiful matte dial. And again, I would never have in a shop, I would probably wouldn't have picked it out, but I have it and it's, it's, I just think it's, it's beautiful. It's like a beautiful dress watch. Absolutely, yeah. With a small size, I mean, with a suit, I mean, this is a, it, it is a kind of a perfect dress watch. We have this Rolex here, the Hulk Submariner. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty recent pickup. Yes. So this is when the Hodinkee addiction started happening. So this was smack in the middle of the pandemic. I was in Hawaii, I was binge watching your stupid videos, and I was like, you know what? There's something in my collection I don't have. It's a Submariner. Yeah. I'll get one Submariner and then I'm done. I'll be done. This is, that's all I need. I got the Speedmaster, I got the Submariner, and then I have you know, my dad's Datejust and like bits and pieces that I think are cool, and I'm done, I'll be done. I just need one Submariner just to, just to legitimize the whole collection. And yeah. so I started looking for one, and the one that caught my eye was the green on green, otherwise known as the Hulk, mm -hmm. because I managed to get a small role in a Marvel movie, Shang-Chi, and I thought, man, what a perfect coincidence. I know it's a nickname, but you know, these nicknames stick on watches. It's so weird. It is, yeah. Yeah. Totally. That, who did that, can I come up with a nickname for a watch? I, I mean, you just gotta uh, go, go for it and be early on the internet. Sure. Uh, the, the, the day just is now called the Ronnie. <laughs> Okay, we're going to refer to this as the Ronnie now. Okay, from now on, you heard it here on Hodinkee first. So yeah, I was like, if there's any watch that has a connection to Marvel, it's the Hulk. And the fact that they discontinued it made me think it's a value play, but really this is the lies we tell ourselves. To, all these are just lies we tell ourselves to justify, you know, collecting these cool things. Again, my wife is always like, you know, when you're submarine, you're not going diving. You're not going one meter, much less... <laughs> whatever this is, 300 meters. But, oh man, this is beautiful. It's, it is beautiful, yeah. yeah. I mean, the ceramic bezel with the matching green dial, it's just, I mean, it's a really, really beautiful watch. And then we have the latest addition to your collection is a watch we have right here, the Rolex GMT Master, a vintage piece, reference 16753, root beer. Yeah, so again, this is where I really got to stop with this watch now, because this is it now. I think I'm done with this collection. I gotta stop watching Hodinki videos, honestly. So yeah, again, you can justify anything in your head. The justification for this was, literally, I'm in Hawaii for six months filming a TV show, and the apartment I'm staying in is facing the Pan Am building. Every day, we'll just look at the Pan Am. <laughs> and because at this point, I'm already into watches, right? So I already know, oh, Pan Am, mm -hmm. oh, GMT. I gotta keep track of time in New York and Hawaii, because I'm, I'm working multiple jobs, multiple time zones. Okay, I'll get a GMT and that's it, mm -hmm. as an actual tool watch. And um, I start looking at GMTs, and you know what, I, uh, no offense to anyone else out there, but I just feel like Pepsi GMTs are so common. It's a little too common for me. Everything that you have is kind of a slight, it's like one or two clicks away from like the mainstream. So you have the first Omega in space, not a straight up moon watch. Sure, you know, sure. you have, for example, you have a 6139, but it's not a Poe. You have the Bruce Lee variants. Right. You have a Submariner, but it's the Hulk. Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm basic, but a little special basic. Let's put it that way. So I thought all the GMTs to me don't, aren't quite doing it for me. But then I saw this two-tone root beer and I was like, yeah, that's, the, that's really special. I never seen anyone with it, really. I was probably going to switch this to a NATO strap. When you have these things for yourself, mm -hmm. you can do whatever you want. There's no rules. You can put a... James Bond, NATO on a Bruce Lee variant, because it's for this you. This looks great, by the way. Yeah. Oh, thanks a lot. Yo, yeah. Okay, well, I'm, well, actually, thank you for your validation. I was scared that I couldn't do that <laughs> until, until, you just, until John Buse from Hodinkee just co-signed it. And I think there's something interesting about combining style and substance. 
in these watches. Because mm -hmm. if you wanted something just functional, you get like a digital readout, yeah. right? So there is an element of style in these things. Mm -hmm. But if it's all style, but you can't read the time, it's useless. Yeah. But the fact that these things are so easy to actually tell the time with mm -hmm. and they look good, it's intriguing. As someone who is interested in self-expression, it's intriguing. How does something look aesthetically good mm -hmm. as well as be functional? Right? I think these design elements are what elevates something from good to great. You know, when, when you do stand-up comedy, you could be doing stand-up comedy on the street corner, or you could be, be doing it at Radio City Music Hall. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same words, the same performance, but the context around it is different. You know, these are the, these are the style elements that elevate what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of what I get out of all of this. You know, it's, it's understanding industrial design and aesthetics and what makes things look good. We've been talking watches for days now. This is day three, <laughs> day three of, of talking time. watches. Uh, I really wish I could go back to my apartment, but um, <laughs> I didn't realize it was more of a hostage situation. <laughs> but I mean, to be fair, you are a nerd. So, yeah. it, I mean, she was accurate. But yeah, I mean, I cannot think of a person who looks more like he hosts talking watches than this guy over here. I mean, if you went to Central Casting and you were like, hey, can you find me a watch guy? Does anyone have the time, by the way? Because <laughs> none of these watches are set and uh, yeah. yeah.